Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Digital Banking Symposium 2020. Our next agenda of the day is on the next banking revolution, a promise of transparency and efficiency, presented by one of the gold sponsors of this symposium, R3. We have with us an esteemed panel today who will be discussing emerging technologies such as blockchain, which have become more important as banks and financial institutions turn to digitalization for new business opportunities. We are joined today by Doris Thieu, Strategic Account Manager, ASEAN R3. Lincoln Yin, Founder and CEO of Rutant. Shinichiro Yamazaki, Global Head of Trade Innovation, Region Head of Trade Finance, APAC, SMBC. And Branson Lee, Executive Committee Member, Singapore Fintech Association. I will now hand my time over to our speakers for their presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the Digital Banking Symposium so far. So as uh, the uh, uh, person has mentioned, uh, my name is Branson. I sit on the Executive Committee uh, for Singapore Fintech Association, and I also lead a digital securities exchange. Uh, today, our session is on the next banking uh, revolution, a promise of transparency and efficiency. Uh, as, as introduced, uh, we have a very distinguished panel today with us. Uh, we have Doris from R3, Shin from SMBC, and Lincoln from Rutan. So I shall not steal their thunder, but uh, I will first start off by getting uh, each of the panelists to uh, introduce themselves and uh, maybe say a few words. Uh, shall we start with Doris? Thank you, Branson. Um, can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Singapore FinTech Association and uh, BFSU for uh, inviting me on this panel and also to Branson as well for moderating this. Uh, so a little bit of intro of myself, I might come across a new face uh, in Singapore FinTech community. In fact, I just relocated here. Uh, my background was in um, electronic trading in capital market, where I was working uh, in Hong Kong for the past um, 12 years. And I was the first hire in R3 Hong Kong to help them set up the office. And uh, now we have a small team over there to cover the greater China region. And uh, right now uh, in R3 Singapore, I'm actually leading the business development activities across ASEAN. So if your company is embarking on an exciting blockchain journey, uh, I'm the woman to go to. Uh, very honored to be here. And um, I also like to thank my uh, fellow panelists, Xinshan and Lincoln, uh, for the support uh, towards the preparation and this uh, session. Looking forward to um, discuss further. Thank you. I think Branson, you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Doris. Uh, can we get uh, Shin maybe to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Branson. Um, my name is Shin Yamazaki from SMBC. Uh, SMBC, uh, Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation, is a leading global bank headquartered in Tokyo. We are present in uh, 40 countries and regions across the globe. Uh, we're here in Singapore for quite a long time. Um, I'm the global head of trade innovation, and uh, this uh, is a newly established unit, and it is mandated to establish a strategy, digital strategy, in the area of trade finance and uh, lead and develop uh, and implement implementation of such uh, technologies. Um, Global banking industry today has been uh, and will continue to face many challenges. A uh, number of those challenges and opportunities will inevitably come along with uh, technology involvement. Uh, DLT in particular is perhaps the most relevant and desired technology uh, from the pre-financing field. We have been working with uh, many uh, technology partners such as R3, uh, together with many banks as well. I'm pleased to share my thoughts and ideas with this vibrant panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Shin. Uh, Lincoln, maybe you can say a few words. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Ying. I'm the CEO and the founder of uh, Rutem. I'm also very honored and pleased to be part of the panel together with the greatest, uh, greater panelists together. Um, so Rutem is a uh, fintech. Uh, headquartered in Singapore. We have branches in Japan and uh, China. Um, our mission is to build 
sustainable economy through inclusive financial services. We are a technology enabler for digital and open banking, provide banking and the service um, for the banks and uh, non-financial platforms. Currently, we focusing on providing easier, cheaper, and a faster supply chain finance. Um, our flagship solution is deep tier or multi-tier supply chain finance in an uh, ecosystem approach. Um, and also a little bit of background about myself. Um, I studied supply chain in university, um, but I started my own company when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, which already uh, nine years. And um, I um, still very um, joined this journey. And um, um, through the technology with um, uh, to um, provide better services um, for the, especially SMEs. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Lincoln. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel. Doris, uh, if you, uh, if anyone wants to explore DLT, that's that's Doris to go to. And then anyone in banking, that will be Shin. And then obviously, uh, SME expert will be uh, Lincoln from Ruten. Okay. Now, uh, before I go on, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, uh, please type it in uh, in the chat box and we'll pick it up uh, after our panel. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, for the first question, uh, it's regarding trade financing and DLT. So uh, we have seen a private and public sector working together to digitalize trade, right? So from, from a network trade platform by Singapore customers to Marco Polo by R3. Now, um, obviously there have been a lot of development in this area uh, from the task of digitalizing trade, sharing of information and, and things like that. Now, from your perspective, why is digitizing trade so critical and, and, and in, especially in Asia? And how does uh, DLT play a role uh, in this process, right? So maybe uh, I will uh, go to Doris first. Thank you, Branson. Uh, well, I think digitizing trade, um, it has been a, a growing sector as we are seeing um, a lot of uh, adoption uh, across different industry. Uh, trade finance is actually one of the leading industry um, for what we have seen so far. And I think when we talk about digitizing trade, uh, how blockchain actually could help. Um, of course, I mean, from different aspects where we are seeing, especially with this year, how the pandemic has um, made an impact across all the industry. Uh, we talk about technology could help to enable, you know, process automation, bring in um, uh, process efficiency, you know, cut down the transaction time, or even like, you know, reduce the reconciliation. There's also another aspect that we see uh, how DLT could really help uh, in digitizing trade. And that's where we are talking about um, how we could help in um, tackle um, trade-based money laundering, as an example. Um, as we probably know about the Hingyang case uh, that happened. Um, so where we see how blockchain could help is essentially to actually um, enable multi-party that are transacting together uh, that don't necessarily trust each other uh, and uh, probably not allowed to share some of their sensitive client data among each other. DLT could provide the platform in a secure way and how our Quora platform design is basically on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and need-to-know basis, right? So we all know that existing uh, anti-money laundering solutions are already in place, right? It could be um, in place in, uh, with the regulators, uh, with the customs, or even with each bank. But there's one thing though, um, all these different uh, AML solutions uh, that have been operated by individual banks, they cannot detect sophisticated schemes such as um, structuring. So structuring here as in referring to um, the money launderers that actually break a large transaction into smaller transactions, and then they pass it on into uh, several banks. So it's very difficult to detect that, where I think this is where DLT come in to drive the collaboration across all the um, multiple parties that are supposed to exchange data together on one secure platform. Uh, we see some of our partners, ISP, have been quite successful, successful in actually digitizing trade by using DLT. Uh, one of our partners here is um, Root N, uh, where Lincoln uh, will actually share a little bit more how they have actually um, revolutionized uh, in providing embedded supply chain finance platform. We also have another partner, uh, Monetago, which has been uh, delivering a live solution since 2018 
uh, process over a million transactions. And what they do essentially is to detect duplicate finance fraud. And so far, um, from what we have learned, they have detected over thousands of um, finance fraud attempts on the business network. So I think DLT uh, is very exciting that we are actually, all three uh, has put in a lot of effort and initiative to, um, um, to actually build something new. Uh, we are also trying to uh, build out this new product. Probably uh, you guys have heard, um, we have announced it uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we are launching a new product called Corda EDL, which is Electronic Deal of Lading. And these two kits that we are developing is actually to um, enable our ISV in trade industry, be it um, supply chain, uh, trade finance, uh, or any trade relevant ISV, uh, to, uh, to actually embed the EDL solution in their existing offering for their end customers. So to conclude my points here, um, I think DLT uh, in helping digitizing trade uh, is important, uh, is the way to go. And uh, we are very excited about it. And we think that we will have more, um, actually we'll have more to come uh, to share with you uh, in the coming near future. Thanks, Doris. That's uh, very interesting. So if I may summarize, you said uh, process reconciliation, uh, money laundering, uh, uh, countering money laundering, multi-party and uh, obviously to, to also uh, prevent structuring um, in, in, in AML stuff. Interesting. How about uh, Shin? Do you have any, any thoughts around this uh, with regard to um, DLT and maybe in, in, in your sector in banking? Okay. Um, thank you, Branson. Um, the law covered by Doris. Um, if, uh, if technology can cover all that, that will be a brilliant start, I guess. Um, but again, once again, I, I agree uh, a lot said by Doris. Um, from um, from bank, banking industry point of view, let me kind of dig in on some old features of trade and how, how technology kind of put a spotlight on those kind of old habits. Um, traditionally, as you all know, large part of the trade finance process depends on the paper. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the point that we're fighting because that's a real source or the real reason of inefficiency. Um, this paper, but what does it do? Paper used to carry information and it used as an evidence of the trade. Um, perhaps it carry the price or the quality. Sometimes it carries a, is a, is a piece of paper to, to show whereabout of those goods. And naturally these papers are checked by uh, trade parties, yeah, importers and sellers, and also for the banks. Uh, to administer the trade and perhaps a trade finance as well. So basically, who checks these papers? It's a, usually it's those very experienced pairs of eyes. Either you are in the seller or the exporter, you're in the banks. Um, you know, usually it's the group of people. So naturally, there's a limit to that. Um, but technology right now is helping the banks to not only check this document, but it's it's actually asking us all do we really need to check um that that's the real point here do we really need to check now with this uh dlt banks and corporates can be assured that the information is coming from who is coming who it should come from and it's coming from the secured uh, channel and uh, if the information matching is assured by the technology or the platform or the system the banking industry will largely enjoy uh, from this uh, huge leap of efficiency, but most importantly, our clients, our customers will, will benefit a lot from that leap. Perhaps this will lead the banks to redefine uh, the subject of trade finance, not focus on the large ones or the um, uh, more um, economically uh, makes sense trade for the banks, but also includes those that which cannot be uh, captured by the existing way, traditional way of doing trade financing. But uh, um, this is probably the efficiency aspect, but perhaps um, one of the things I also agree to Doris is that uh, uh, assurance, um, the how to strengthen, how to en enhance the security of the banking. Now, we all know that the uh, uh, fraud case has hit the uh, press, uh, not only in Singapore, but uh, in the region perhaps globally as well. So banking industry was hit 
um, since then, um, many good initiatives has taken place. You know, obviously, SNBC has been taken into uh, taking part of that of those initiatives. I believe I believe that technology is also uh, very relevant in this area. Just to give you one small example, um, avoiding double finance is one of the interesting areas where technology can make significant changes. Uh, DLT allows banks to have a common structure uh, whereby they can share the encrypted and specific information uh, to each other. Banks will kind of uh, draw uh, more assurance and they will come back to the efficiency and the inclusiveness uh, of the trade financing. With uh, more banks joining this technology and multi-bank uh, platforms, I'm sure the trade finance will have will evolve and uh, reshape uh, in the future. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Shin. Actually, that's quite interesting because in the blockchain world, I think we have this. Uh, it solves the issue of uh, double spending, and and here you are talking about uh, double financing. I think that's that's a very interesting uh, uh, parallel that we can draw from. Um, yeah, um, let me go on to the next question, which roughly is in line with what we have, uh, you know, uh, sort of talked about, uh, but it's more in terms of uh, future of banking, right? So I think we all know what banking is, but uh, uh, there are talks that, you know, banking is everywhere, uh, but, uh, you know, never at a bank. Um, how do you see this trend or do you agree with this trend? And, and if yes, how is your organization uh, reacting to this trend? Yeah. Doris? Or maybe uh Shin, you want to because this is banking. Any any okay. thoughts? Uh, yeah. right. I understand. Thanks, Branson. That's that's good. I can start. Um I, I think nobody doubts that the banking or the banking service will look very differently uh in the future. And um no doubt that data or technology will will be fully leveraged to achieve that. Now, let, let me kind of approach this subject from the from my field, trade financing field. Um, literally, uh, trade finance will not be an exception. Perhaps one of the most uh, that benefits from this change. Um, trade financing has not really uh, changed that much in perhaps last few decades. We still have the old habits. Once again, you know, we're, we're handling the papers. Whether it can be kind of scanned copy or not, um, but still things going around uh, by DHL and other ways of uh, transportation documents. Um, <clears throat> so again, I guess uh, no one disagrees that the future will, will, will change and the technology will help a lot for us to change uh, how we do trade financing. Um, just to give you an example, um, Digital payment commitment, or perhaps uh, uh, digital ledger payment commitment, can be considered one of those. Um, this is relatively new, based fully based on the technology. Uh, this new way of commitment can be issued by the banks, or can be issued by the final buyer of the goods. Some systems, it's not only one system or one platform. So some systems allows the commitment to be tokenized or can be transferable as well, while some can be used uh, to support the trade. Uh, efficient way of doing trade, efficient way of involving banks uh, in one platforms. Uh, one of the samples is, is Marco Polo. Um, this is the one that SNBC joins. Um, on this Marco Polo platform, uh, buyers and sellers in their respective banks on the platform uh, we will join the platform and just to simplify, once this buyer's kind of trade information matches the seller's information, um, it will lead the banks to guarantee and commit, issue a commitment uh, for the payment. It works effectively like a guarantee. Um, so uh, this is again, relatively new idea and I, I'm sure this new kind of products will also be part of the future in the trade financing. Another, another perhaps related area is, uh, can be found in the ESG. Um, mm. Yeah, this, for example, if you focus, if you kind of take a lead on the traceability function of the DLT, 
um, this mm. uh, one of the exciting developments uh, can be found. Uh, for example, exciting firms called uh, Carbon Chain, uh, they use the carbon footprint data, uh, which includes uh, how much carbon emission has been kind of uh, uh, done uh, to produce certain goods. And that goods, when you do the trade, that uh, certain carbon footprint data can be also shared uh, using the DLT. And obviously the buyers uh, to, to enhance and support their ESG effort, they can also use that data to make sure that the uh, final uh, consumers are buying the goods from the ESG uh, well, responsible companies as well. I guess this is just merely one example of the application of the technology, but I think this kind of effort, this kind of application will be a multiple in the future. And again, that will also help the future of trade financing. Got it. Got it. Thank, thanks, uh, Shin, for, for showing us uh, two different examples of Marco Polo as well as ESG. Very interesting. I'm conscious of the time, but uh, maybe Doris, you can have uh, uh, maybe, you know, in the area of CBDC, maybe you can share a little bit, maybe uh, yeah, one, two minutes. Sure, absolutely. I think uh, I agree with what Shin had just mentioned, right? I think if you look at the future of banking, uh, bank will still play a very important role for the next few um, yeah. decades. And in fact, I think uh, on the CVDC area, this is where we see um, public sector, uh, for example, uh, the central banks are also trying mm. to lead uh, initiative in exploring central bank digital currency. Uh, exploration on the wholesale banking level. Uh, we have had the uh, opportunity and honor to work with, for example, like Bank of Thailand and uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authority in the past, where we explore how we could actually um, um, deep dive into digital currency would impact uh, the wholesale banking world between central bank and the banks. And this is something very interesting and, uh, and uh, where it has, kept, it has kept us very, very busy where now we are working on a working group, which is our tree led And because of the work that we have done for the past few years and the reports uh, and the research that have found, even together with MAS in Singapore, uh, the working group that we are doing right now, what we have seen is a lot of passion, a lot of um, incoming queries where we managed to put together like a group of 40, over 40 central banks, regulators mm. and government agency coming together, uh, give their insight, input, share their concerns uh, from each jurisdiction, challenges. And I think all these um, valuable inputs where we will be announcing uh, in a couple of weeks time in a, in a report format, after all the working group that has been run for almost about three months, uh, will actually um, give us some direction or even some um, insight to have a peek what will be the future like for banking to play a role in a digital payment, Sounds so good. so yeah, so that, that I think that will be the insight, uh, interesting space to watch out. Yeah, I think uh, CBDC is a is an up and coming topic. Uh, of course, we can spend the whole day talking about CBDC, but uh, let me let me switch gear a little bit. Uh, I want to bring in Lincoln here to talk about SMEs because uh, obviously Lincoln has been working with a lot of SMEs and in the area of uh, trade financing. So. Obviously, I mean, without uh, you know going too much into COVID, obviously we know it has devastated a lot of economies around the world, and including supply chain and SMEs. Obviously, uh, bear the brunt of all this, um, I guess, uh, disruption. Now, uh, Lincoln, can you share with us, you know, how does um, you know, uh, perhaps DLT or even what you're doing over here help uh, you know alleviate some of these issues? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eva. So first, of course, everyone um, have to agree that SME are very important to economy. Like globally, there are more than 150 million SMEs employing 60% of the working population and are contributing nearly 50% of world's GDP. In Singapore, they make up 99% of all enterprises, employ 72 of the percent of the workforce and uh, 40, uh, 44 percent of the GDP. But so when we talk about like how can support SMEs, um, many people may think about more from government angle to provide like uh, financial leave, those things. But, but actually, 
in the real practice, um, we think there should be three key approach. One is the ecosystem approach. So government is key to provide those support, but more important is the anchors in the ecosystem. The anchor can be a financial institution in a certain industry, which is very strong, or the anchor in the in the in a in a value chain or in a e ecosystem that they have very very strong influence for their upstream and downstream. Um, and so through this um, ecosystem approach, the anchor can lead um, the financial um, first start with the supply chain uh, initiative to with a better supply chain management, and then to provide supply chain um, finance. Because um, now the trend is uh, the world is uh, moving from lending or loan to movable assets based financing, for example, receivable financing. Um, so which is exactly the most of the working capital burden for the SMEs. So also this is where um, our own solution, multi-tier or deep-tier financing can play a very important role. The second part is actually very important is the digitization. So here the digitization, not only for the banking part, though we talk about like a digital banking, but actually the digitization for SMEs, enterprises, large corporates are all very important especially for uh, SMEs, their digitization is exactly like the last mile in that digitization. So, and actually another side is the digitization of a bank or integration of a bank internally. That's maybe the last three miles <laughs> for the digitization. That's a lot, um, many different banking system, those. So then um, um, unless until the, um, the whole end-to-end -end from the enterprises to the banks, all digital, and then it will share a lot of data across the whole, the, the all participants, and then to can um, to solve the uh, to to control the risk management, because in for SMEs uh, the most important very come the risk. So then, if through more data and uh, the workflow capital flow controlled, then the risk controlled, and then through digitization, uh, digital um, financial service offering then the operational cost can also be decreased. Then at that time, finally the banks, they wanted to participate in such a initiative. And uh, then the last part is uh, how can um, have more broadened collaboration across financial institutions, government, and also very types of financial institution. For example, uh, for Ruten, we in China, we had a, a, a collaboration across banks, insurers, guarantors, and uh, we get uh, alternative uh, data from government, and then the financing costs uh, decrease sixty percent for the um, SMEs. Um, what they can have in the past. So then um, the last part is um, also to create a new products across the different uh, those all those participants. For example, can like uh, in the ESG perspective to have a green finance, even like uh, Islamic finance as a part of the. Uh, supply chain finance or financial uh, purpose, the financial services. Then for SMEs, they can get the financing uh, anytime and uh, in any uh, demand point that will really help them. That's the three key parts, the points. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Lincoln. Very interesting. Uh, you know, talking about receivables, financing, uh, digitizing of trade and, and, and things like that. Uh, I'm conscious of the time. Um, so we have one last question, maybe just a quick one from everyone. Now, obviously there's banks, there is uh, you know private sector and there's SME. Uh, what do you think are some of the collaborative efforts or if you may see it as a challenge uh, between all three uh, you know, uh, parties? Uh, maybe a quick one-liner, uh, starting from Doris maybe, and then we'll move on to the uh, Q&A. Sure. One liner, probably not enough, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think uh, when it comes to uh, financial institution and fintech, uh, you know, uh, working on uh, technology adoption, I would say uh, one of the common challenge that we see is resources and prioritization um, for for basically for financial institution to adopt uh, new projects because we have seen some of the banks are very very revolutionary and they would like to adopt you know new in innovation. Uh, and, uh, but then they also have internal resources constraint. Uh, this is where I think uh, R3, uh, a lot of the time, we come in as augment, uh, the team, where we provide professional services uh, help to um, enable the banks or financial institution 
to actually um, move forward to their um, innovation journey. How about you, Shane? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once again, I agree with Doris. Uh, resource, limited resource, uh, hence prioritization. A um, lot of things going on simultaneously. Uh, it's very hard to keep up for anyone. Which one is a winning winning platform? We know nobody knows. So inclusiveness, just got to try out, um, just be part of it, be included. That will be the message. Thanks. Thanks. Lincoln? Um, yeah, um, the, um, I think the challenge uh, or, yeah, so the working with the banks, it's um, a quite long process. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a improving. <laughs> yeah, it's a getting better. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Okay, um, we have a few questions. Of um, unfortunately, we cannot take every single one. Uh, but here's an interesting one, uh, uh, maybe to to some of us, uh, especially Shin. Um, and of course, this is a digital banking uh, symposium. So um, people are interested to know what are some of the blockchain projects out there that the banks have been exploring, and are there any successes so far? Should I start? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, there, uh, there are uh, clearly a few, more than a few projects and platforms has been uh, um, has been tested and, and run. Um, and some regions have a different uh, platforms. Uh, just to just to give you an example, um, uh, Contour, which is an LC based uh, platform. Uh, the company has been established in Singapore, uh, and it is uh, uh, really gaining uh, a lot of bank support uh, in this space. And SNBC is uh, happy to be one of those banks. Uh, together with that LC part, there's a non-LC open account platform is the one that I mentioned during my uh, uh, quick chat earlier. Um, that's Marco Polo. And once again, they also have 30 over banks uh, to support. Uh, those are uh, those banks spread are global as well. Um, if you look across to the European side, of course, there are a couple of other platforms as well, namely uh, We Love Trade or, or Congo. Um, some platforms are, are specifically catered to certain types of clients. Um, others are more uh, function and product driven. Um, Again, uh, many banks are involved and I'm, I'm happy uh, that all entire industry is deepening the understanding and knowledge. So we're getting a lot of inquiries from everywhere. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not only SNBC and all other banks. Oh, I'll, I'll pause here, Harrison. Got it. And anyone want, uh, maybe Doris, you want to share a little bit what you have seen? Obviously a yeah. large part of it will be CBDC, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think CBDC is one of them uh, that will be heavily uh, driven by the central bank. So it, it really depends on the jurisdiction. We have seen a lot of uh, success and traction uh, mm. in, in Singapore by MAS. Uh, mm. Well, I think the question about blockchain project uh, banks are exploring, I think another important, I think important or interesting point is also uh, the blockchain projects are live in production, right? Mm. This is yeah. where um, a lot of people are also interested to find out. Uh, we right. have seen a lot of um, projects that are moving towards um, migrates to production uh, journey. Uh, one of the one of them is, um, uh, is something to do with supply chain as an example uh, for procure to pay. How do we actually enable the supply chain uh, to procure, uh, to actually streamline their procurement processes for invoice to pay and invoice to receive? Uh, essentially, it's the same thing uh, to actually reduce paperwork, reduce manual processes, reduce reconciliation. And I think now is the time that we are looking at a production uh, project that are quite interesting. Got it. How about Lincoln? Uh, also, maybe just to give you another bonus question how, how does your platform assess credit risk in the times of uh you know unprecedented pandemic event yeah also yeah yeah understand yeah let me just take a quick uh quick response i think that uh there will be three uh main um approach one is um so um because in in the credit um the, the 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 protecting or uh, it's a uh, the uh, fraud risk is always actually the very most key part. So we 
Um, we will use like alternative data from government, from logistics companies, um, from the from the industry. Then can uh, first to to validate the project, the 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 the, the, the transaction is a real one. This is the first part. The second is um, um, we um, um, we we more to uh, less look at the SME itself, but more to look at the whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, like um, in 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 China, we have a uh, we have a, a product which is a, a Bitbank uh, finance, the loan for Bitbank. For that one, so even the financier, they don't look, they don't need to look at the, uh, the 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 credit credibility of the SME itself, but because the capital flow and uh, uh, it's already controlled, so it's a more to validate the project is a real one, and then can uh, already control the risk. You know, there are many different so uh, the. The, the, the other methods, the more based on what's the scenario uh, and the context, and then to design the, uh, the, the, the method. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Lincoln. Uh, there's one question here, um, you know, uh, asking about, is it necessary to have, um, to join a consortium or can a bank actually set up a blockchain project by itself? I guess uh, the, the, the audience is asking whether they can, you know, probably join the bank as, as part of this, uh, you know, project. Yeah. I guess I'll take this question. Sure. Uh, well, the good news is you can do both. Uh, so as uh, Shin Shan has actually shared about um, the consortium approach uh, network, uh, like um, Marco Polo and Contour, they started off as consortium and then it was a successful uh, use case and converted into um, a, a commercial business entity where they are actually um, commercialize their solution right now to the banks. So that would be one of the example. And uh, the other example would be uh, a bank could definitely set up a project by themselves, right? Uh, now, uh, in the past, we have actually received a lot of um, questions uh, about, oh, if we need a network effect, if we need um, a lot of multi-parties to come together, uh, it's going to take very long to have a project, a uh, blockchain project to go live. Uh, it's, 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 not, um, it's not untrue, but also these days where we are seeing interesting uh, trend is the banks or even a large MNC corporate with a lot of subsidiaries and branches, they are looking to develop blockchain project to actually serve for internal purposes. Because when you talk about reducing um, you know, manual process paperwork, this doesn't only exist on a cross-border or cross-industry um, uh, 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 situation. It also applies within the company, intra-entity, whereby, for example, if you are talking about a multinational company, uh, your headquarters is in uh, Singapore, and then you have your branches in Hong Kong or India, and all these multi-entity uh, that are transacting with each other, blockchain can come into play to actually take away a lot of burden on the paperwork processes, uh, as well as reconciliation. Thank you. Thanks. Shen, do you want to add on to what Doris said? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Manson. Um, once again, uh, I agree with Doris. Um, it can be just one bank or consortium banks. Um, kind of a, a making the consensus, ease of making consensus is probably very different. Uh, if it's a top down, one, one bank's running the uh, entire platform, it's more agile. Um, perhaps spreading out could be uh, challenging. Uh, when it's come to a consortium, reaching a consensus might be uh, taking time, but uh, it will be more uh, easy to scale up the entire, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the uh, console, um, of the network. Now, um, another point I think Doris has uh, interestingly mentioned, a lot of, uh, it's not only the banks who's trying to kind of create this uh, network. It can be sector, it can be uh, intra-company, or it can be a certain uh, supply chain like Link Lincoln is working on. And I think that what the banks or the banking industry may face in the future is that uh, how do we efficiently settle what is conducted, what is traded on those private networks? How can we support, how can the banking industry support those private networks better, faster, in more secured way? Um, I think uh, industry is already seeing that uh, 
up, upcoming challenges and the questions. And I think their answer is not only one, but I think that is one of the interesting areas to discuss, perhaps next year. Thanks, Shin. Lincoln, do you have any experience working with the banks? Uh, do you want to share a little bit? Um, uh, um, banks, the, the, uh, yeah, I, I don't have further to, to add. I think already <laughs> no problem. Kind of agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, so as a final question, uh, I, I guess this is a good uh, segue into, into this question. Um, so what, what will be the next development focus for banks or, or what do you see uh, will be the focus area for blockchain uh, or, or for, bank, for banks? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, Lincoln, you want to start off? What's the next big thing in, in, uh, in 2021 uh, from, from your point of view? Um, I think, yeah, I quite agree with uh, uh, Yamazaki-san just to mention for next year or in the in the coming, it's more and more uh, ecosystem or certain supply chain industry, they they will collaboration uh, together, the, how the banks can provide embedded uh, finance, be part of it. So in the past, it's uh, like the banks use uh, their branch to provide service, then ATM, <laughs> it's all offline. And now uh, later they through their own portal but in the future, actually, it's uh, the bank is uh, anywhere. It's uh, invisible, but you feel it's anywhere. <laughs> so they all embedded into different uh, contexts, different uh, ecosystem. So I think that will be the next big thing. Yeah, <clears throat> banking everywhere. Nice, uh, Doris. Any any thoughts uh, where the focus area will be twenty twenty one? Uh, yes, I have many thoughts, actually. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> other than trade finance, uh, which we really see a lot of traction, uh, I think the next, uh, the other area that is relevant to banks will be uh, around asset tokenization. This is where we see a lot of traction. And also, I think this has been ongoing since the last few years. Uh, we talk about, uh, we have seen like cases like tokenizing a ski resort, for example. Uh, or a real estate um, commercial building. Uh, and we also know that, you know, uh, recently a leading um, Singaporean bank also launching um, a, a, a digital, ex a digital uh, asset exchange. So yeah. we, we, we see that digital asset will be the next and upcoming uh, in 2021. Uh, yeah. A lot of bond tokenization project has been launched uh, across APEC. Yeah. So this is an area to watch out as well. Got it. Asset tokenization. I totally agree with that. <laughs> How about uh, uh, Shin? Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, so, 2021. Yes, 2021. Uh, probably the banks uh, and uh, the industry will, will see a lot of platforms yep. uh, conducting their uh, first deal or the live, going live. Uh, mm -hmm. The real transaction going through the platforms, etc., that is probably going to be more um, more clear and more um, more more present there. Now, through this process, I think the corporates will see what exactly platforms can do for their for their business. It's not mm -hmm. about the banks; it's it's more about the more about the companies, more about the users. How can we use uh, this platform? How can that help us? making things more easy uh, perhaps in, in in line with the COVID, how can that help us reduce the paperwork probably that is the real uh, uh, kind of changes can be observed in 2021 now as doris mentioned earlier a lot of uh, uh, platforms is uh, uh, going to the production stage and we're for example marco polo we're expecting the first deal to uh, happen uh, very shortly um, hopefully we don't. I don't need to wait until 2021. But yeah. anyway, um, a lot of banks are probably in the similar situation, and uh, I I really genuinely hope that the corporates have a taste of it, try it, and if it you know not it won't work for everybody, but if it works, um, it will it will hopefully uh, tremendously help the efficiency and help the corporates. Thank you. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Shin. So there you have it. I think we have run out of time, uh, but just to round up, uh, we talked about CBDC, we talked about digitalization, we talked about uh, you know uh, monetization of receivables, uh, we talked about uh, asset tokenization. Uh, those are very, very current and, and very important topics up and coming. Uh, 
so thank you again uh, to the panelists for sharing your views. I think uh, we learned a lot from, from what you've shared today. Uh, and uh, please, uh, audience, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, one last final words, maybe uh, Doris, uh, Yamasaki-san and uh, Lincoln, how do people reach you if they have any questions? Uh, um, yeah, do you have any, any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> how do people reach you? Uh, my ladies first, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you can reach me by email. It's very simple. Doris.teal at r3.com. Uh, yeah, any inquiries, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great. How about, uh, uh, yeah, Yamasake san? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to read out my email. It's too long. Uh, <laughs> anybody who's interested, please find me on LinkedIn. Um, SNBC is open for new ideas, new business. Uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Nice. And Lincoln? Yeah, the same. Uh, linking or uh, our website, anywhere. Yeah, very easy. Great. Great. So LinkedIn, uh, it seems to be the way. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again uh, to everyone um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Branson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Oris Teo, Mr. Lincoln Yin, Mr. Shinichara Yamazaki, and Mr. Branson Lee for your insightful sharing. Up next on the agenda, we have managing legal and regulatory risks faced by digital banks in APAC, presented by the gold sponsor of the Digital Banking Symposium 2020, Clifford Chance. Do click on the next session button located at the bottom of this page, and I will see you shortly at 2.15 p.m.